discuss uh, competitiveness, or if we were to discuss uh, competitiveness of a nation, uh, we could uh, start a list of uh, theoretical determinants of uh, competitiveness. Um, or we could ask a question that I think is uh, a lot more illuminating and it's a lot more uh, insightful. And this, the answer to this question will help us understand and help us determine what are the strengths or weaknesses of uh, a particular economy. The question is, imagine that Mark Zuckerberg had been, uh, for example, Kazakhstani. Had Mark Zuckerberg been born in Kazakhstan, would we have Facebook today? And if the answer is no, why? No, uh, when you answer this question, why, you will see the weaknesses of the Kazakhstani economy. Now, a lot of these weaknesses are probably have been already discussed. If Mark Zuckerberg had been from Kazakhstan, he would probably have uh, bureaucratic problems. He would have, uh, he would face institutional problems like the ones uh, mentioned by uh, Daron this morning, regulatory barriers, uh, financial, he would have financial problems. He would probably not find uh, 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 finan uh, fi ways of financing his idea. He would have problems with the labor market. He would have problems with um, the sophistication of businesses, the, the, uh, uh, the uh, domestic and uh, international market size, uh, infrastructures, all of the things that have been discussed in the previous sessions are true. Okay, but before, uh, before um, implementing his idea, there is a deeper question, which is not had Mark Zuckerberg been Kazakhstani and had uh, Facebook idea, would he have been able to implement it? The deeper and previous question is, would if he had been Kazakhstani, would he have the idea? Which brings us to the origin of ideas. Where do ideas come from? And here people make big mistakes. People means government officials, economists, researchers, because we tend to identify ideas with R&D. Theorists usually model ideas through R&D. We measure ideas, we measure the effort uh, to come up with ideas with uh, R&D spending. We measure the output of the idea process as, as patents, ideas coming from R&D. Uh, politicians usually uh, try to uh, make a country competitive by investing in R&D, by uh, uh, um, deciding to increase the share of R&D in a global GDP or in total GDP. But are ideas really coming from R&D? Now picture the following companies. Picture in your head the following companies and think about what do they have in common. What do these companies have in common? Starbucks, Cirque du Soleil, Zara, Ikea, and McDonald's. What do they have in common? Well, obviously, they are great business ideas, aren't they? Great business ideas. Second, there are great business ideas in very traditional sectors, right? We started cooking about 1.7 million years ago. 1.7 million years later, in that very first sector in the economy, the very first sector in humanity, uh, there is innovation in, uh, in the food industry with McDonald's. We uh, started, uh, we, we, we invented the needle 40,000 years ago. 40,000 years later, 40,000 years after inventing clothing, uh, Zara innovates uh, in the clothing industry. We've had uh, furniture, you know, for 15,000 years, the cavemen had furniture. 15,000 years later, we, IKEA, innovate in the furniture industry. Ideas, this is very important because people tend to confuse innovation with uh, R&D in high-tech sectors. That's why governments want to promote uh, pharmaceuticals or telecommunications. They confuse R&D with ideas. 
But what these, what these three what companies have in common, besides being great innovations in very traditional sectors, they have one other thing in common. None of these great business ideas comes from R&D. None of their creators is a researcher. None of them have a single patent. Yet, there are great business innovations. Guy La Liberté of uh, uh, Cirque du Soleil was a street performer. The creators of Starbucks were a poet, a historian, and an English teacher. The creator of, idea, of IKEA was a student. Amancio Ortega of Zara was a worker. And the creator of McDonald's was a salesperson. None of them was a scientist. Now, one further evidence is, uh, comes from industries that really do invest a lot in R&D. If I had, had, if I had given this conference 10 years ago, I had asked you, show me your phones. What would you have shown me? All of you would show me a Nokia, right? Nokia was the most successful company in the world, even today. Eight of the 10 best-selling phones in the history of mankind, eight of 10 are still Nokia. The best-selling was the 1100. 250 million copies of that phone were sold. And the 1110, 250 additional copies the following year. Nokia was the highest R&D spender in the world in the telecommunications industry. And in all industries, Nokia beat, spent more in R&D than the pharmaceuticals, which are the highest spenders, and the car industry. In 2000, Nokia shares were $56 a share. Today, Nokia is gone from $56 a share all the way down to two. And at that point, it was bought by Microsoft, and it disappeared. Despite all that R&D, why? Because R&D is not innovation. So you have industries that do not spend in R&D, great success stories, innovative stories, great business ideas, and we have big spenders in R&D that disappear. So it's about time that we learn the lesson. Where do ideas come from? Well, the answer is given by a book, given to us by a book, uh, uh, in a book by uh, Amar Bidet, a colleague of mine at Columbia, the name of the book is similar to the name of the book of Charles Darwin on the origin and evolution, not of species, but of businesses. When he asks, where do great ideas, business ideas come from, 72% of ideas come from workers. 20% of ideas come not from workers, but from regular people that are not scientists, street performers, poets, history teachers, only 8% of ideas come from R&D. And if we keep this in mind, the lessons are uh, dramatic. Let me give you seven important lessons out of this insight that have to do with how we should conduct our businesses and how we should organize our education system. Lesson number one, we should prioritize basic education. If you have a fixed budget constraint and you don't have money for everything, most countries actually prioritize university education because they think of R&D. See, if ideas came from R&D, then the best uh, schooling strategy would be one in which we select the best students in every school, we put them in a school for privileged minds, we teach them how to do research. In the meantime, the rest of us can go to the bar and drink beer and wait for these people to come up with ideas, right? But ideas do not come from these people. Ideas come from regular people, poets, street performers, workers, students. So the school system that we need to emphasize is the school in which all of these people are present, which is primary school, not advanced school. And by the way, when we look at the World Economic Forum's rankings, that's one of the worst areas for Kazakhstan primary schooling, the quality of primary schooling. Second thing we need to do is understand the world in which we live, and more importantly, the world in which our children will live. 
If you look at the picture, picture any classroom in this country, classroom. And then put it together next to a picture of a classroom 100 years ago, 200 years ago. And you see the classrooms are identical. Same tables, same chairs, same boards, same chalk, same eraser, and in some classrooms even the same teacher. <laughs> and the world has changed dramatically. The world has changed in dramatic ways that undermine the way we teach. The pillars of education are completely blown out by what's happening today. See, last Christmas I gave my, my niece a book. She's two years old. You know what she did? She opened the book and she started pressing the words. When she realized that nothing was happening, she concluded that had, I had given her a broken iPad, so she threw it away. She, well, she thought it was a completely useless device, a book. Because these people, have, have you seen children operate with iPhones today, two years old? How do they learn that? They live in a different world. They live in the technological world. We parents live in the books world, very different world. And this changes dramatically the way we should think of education. This, this completely blows up the pillars on which education is founded. See, one of the pillars on which education is founded is that the teacher knows more than the student, right? The student doesn't know anything, the teacher knows. Education is a process of transmitting uh, knowledge from the teacher who knows to the student that doesn't know, true? Now think of what happens in any school in Kazakhstan when the computer breaks down. Who is the least qualified person to solve the problem? The teacher. And you know what? The students know that. And therefore, the students think, if this guy doesn't know something as important as technology, necessarily what he's teaching me has to be worthless. So they lose respect because they live in a different world. The world has changed. Have you realized that, that students today, the children today, don't read instructions? See, when we, my generation, when the new computer arrives at home, or the new TV, or the new VCR arrives at home, first thing we do is instructions manual. Let's read the manual, right? Put the cable, the yellow cable on the yellow uh, slot, the red cable on the red slot. By the time we get to the green slot, our children are finished, right? They have finished installing it without instructions. And you know why they don't have instructions? Why do, live, why do they live in a world without instructions? Because they do something that we hate. They play video games. Have you realized that there's no instructions in video games? Parents hate video games. They think they're bad for education. We tend to forbid video games, right? You can only play for one hour a day or half an hour a day. But think about video games. The most silly game, Super Mario, any game, no instructions. How do they, how do they learn? How do children learn to play those games? Well, they see various images, some look that might be good, some look that might be bad. They hypothesized, right? This guy looks like evil, this guy looks like gold. Let's, let's touch the gold, let's not touch the evil. Hypothesis, then they try and they fail or they succeed. If they succeed, they go on. If they fail, they start over. Hypothesis, trial and error, right? We tend to forbid something that is teaching them at a very early age the scientific method that we will later teach them in life. We'll teach them in engineering schools. See, they live in a different world. And because they live in a different world, we should teach them according to, uh, to the world in which they live, in the, the world in which they will live. They will not live in the world of books. They will live in the world of video games. So let's use this enthusiasm that they have or video games to teach them, to attract them to the knowledge they need to be innovative. Third, the importance of the question. See, ideas have two parts, a question and an answer, right? There's always a question, there's always an answer. In school, we tend to teach the answer. We teach them how to solve problems. We evaluate. The way we evaluate in PISA, we evaluate school systems all over the world, the PISA exams. We don't evaluate the quality of the questions. 
In fact, we don't teach questions. In fact, we penalize questions. What happens to a student that asks too many questions? The, student, the, the other students complain, the, the, the teachers complain, even parents complain. Initially, parents try to answer the question, daddy, why, daddy, why, daddy, why? Initially, you answer, but after a few whys, even parents, they stop asking. But see, without questions, there's no ideas. And in fact, students, kids, when they come to school for the first time, they ask questions all the time. They have a natural curiosity. By the time they reach my classroom at the university, no questions. Where is all the curiosity gone? We killed it. See, without curiosity, they're not going to survive. Children entering school today, they will retire in 2085. How is the world going to look like in 2085? What technologies will there be available? What jobs will there be available? We don't know. Yet we have to prepare them to live and work in that world. We, we don't know what world that will be. See, the, 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 the only thing that will help them survive is curiosity. All our children have all the information produced by humanity, all of the information produced by humanity in all history in their pockets. There's only one barrier between them and all that information, and that is themselves. They have to look for it. Look for it means asking questions. And the great business ideas usually come from questions. When I met Amancio Ortega, the creator of Zara, I, I told him, you know, that, you, that people study Zara in business schools as a great innovation, as a great example of innovation. Did you know that? He says, no, no, I'm not an innovator. The only thing I do is I ask questions. I always ask why. I need to understand what's going on. And when uh, I don't understand, when the answer is given, that is given to me is not satisfactory, then I ask another question. Why not? Why not doing differently? See, the great innovation of Amancio Ortega was actually doing things differently in a very traditional sector. Since uh, Christian Dior invented Pret-a-Porter in 1920, the world of uh, fashion was essentially some uh, gurus, designers, that are in contact with God, and they know what we are going to like next year. They design some clothes with some colors, with some shapes. And then these designs are sent to the poorest possible country where they are manufactured, millions of units, and they are sent back to the rich world. And they do that twice a year, summer and winter. Right? And then here comes Amancio Ortega and asks, why? Why do we do that? Why don't we do it differently? Well, the answer, why do we do it? The answer was because Christian Dior said so. And said, why don't we do it differently? What if the guru makes a mistake? And we have made three million copies of these green pens, and nobody likes green pens. Why don't we ask people what they want? And instead of having gurus, we have young designers that, are, that, are, you know, uh, that go to parties with these young people, and they go to school with these young people, and they design these clothes. And instead of designing many, many units, we design very few units. And instead of them producing in the third world, we produce next door to the customer so we can go really, really fast when people change tastes. And when he did that, he found that uh, Instead of, you know, the competition, which would be H&M, they have the same clothes for six months because they do that twice a year. So you go to H&M, you look around, and then you know that uh, next week they will have the same thing, and three weeks later have the same thing. If you go to Zara, either you buy or you lose because it's not going to be the same next week. So people buy more often. And besides, because uh, um, things change every week, people go to Zara more often. The typical customer of H&M goes to the store three times a year. The, three, the typical customer of Zara goes 17 times a year. So the customers go more often, and every time they go, they buy with a higher probability, so they sell all the clothes at full price. H&M, at the end of the semester, they have to sell 40% of their clothes at half price in sales. So even though originally the price of Zara is actually lower, in fact, it ends up being higher. You're selling at a higher price which m makes uh, Amancio Ortega the second richest man in the world. And everything because he asked questions. By the way, he would be the first richest man in the world had not he divorced, which is another idea, another innovation that I'm not going to be too discussing today. Four, observation. 
They mentioned IKEA. You know the great innovation of IKEA? Great innovation idea is what we call, what they call flat pack. All the furniture is packed in uh, flat packages that can be stored and transported by the customer. Customer, uh, because it's flat, uh, it, it, it doesn't take so much space. It's cheaper to store. Uh, customers can take them home the same day. Uh, the customers actually pay the transportation. The customers actually pay the, uh, the, uh, the, 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 the mounting of the, of the, of the, of the uh, furniture, and therefore they can sell very, very cheaply. You know where a flat pack idea came from? It didn't come from Camp Pratt. It didn't come from the owner. Actually, the owner uh, um, hired a marketing company to do a promotion, a promotion of a, of a table called the Leaf Table, one of the most famous tables in the, in the history of IKEA. And uh, the photographer, he didn't know anything about, uh, about uh, furniture. Uh, he decided to take a picture of the table you know, in the woods with trees and flowers. And he tried to put the table in the car. He didn't fit because he was not uh, an expert in furniture. He cut the legs and uh, he could fit in the car. And uh, Camprad was looking and said, wow, what a great idea. That's how Flatpad uh, uh, came to exist, observation. You know what is the best way to teach observation? Let me ask you another question. Can you draw a bicycle? If I give you two circles today, could you draw a bicycle? Have you seen a bicycle? Do you know what I'm talking about? Do you know what a bicycle is? So if I, if I ask you to draw a bicycle, we don't have time to do it today, but I give you a piece of paper. 90% of you would not be able to draw a bicycle. In fact, 50% of you would draw a line between one wheel and the other wheel, which is the perfect way to ensure that the front wheel cannot move. Why? Why can't, why can't you ride, well, the, draw a bicycle? Because you never paid attention. If you don't pay attention, you're not going to have ideas. You know what's the best way to pay attention? Drawing. Once I ask you to draw a bicycle, you look at it, you, look at it, you will draw it, and then you'll remember forever. The best way to uh, be observant is the arts. What is the importance of the arts in our school system? Does PISA ask art questions? Does PISA evaluate arts? Painting, dancing, creativity. No. PISA evaluates math and evaluates science and evaluates writing. Arts are not important. Five, ideas have sex. Ideas are usually the connection of our other ideas. Ideas connect with ideas to create new ideas. Cirque du Soleil is a great innovation. When Guy La Liberté entered the market, the circus was dying. People were fed up with lions and animals. People, people don't care for animals anymore, in, in, you know, enslaved animals. People don't care for the big families of, uh, of uh, performers in circus. So the circus was in real, real trouble. And there comes Guy La Liberté, and he merges the circus with the theater by putting a, a, a storyline. The circuses didn't have a storyline. And then he puts the Broadway music and Olympic gymnasts. And by merging different areas of different sectors, he creates an entirely new sector. We still call it circus, but it's something very different. Cirque du Soleil. Ideas come from uh, putting together different ideas. Now, do we teach people, do we teach our children to Merge ideas. If you look at the school system, we do exactly the opposite. We compartmentalize education. At 9, you do math. At 10, you do science. At 11, you do history. And what you learn in math has nothing to do with history, because history and math are different things. But that's very wrong. See, when they have to come up with ideas later on, if you're a mathematician, sometimes your ideas come from anthropology. But you will not be able to innovate if you haven't ever studied anthropology. And we teach people to hyper-specialize. You are an economist, but an economist doesn't mean you know about economics. You know what a very tiny little bit of economics, mathematical microeconomics of the firm, right? Tiny, tiny, tiny part. And that was good in the industrial age when we needed people that, were, that should have been perfect substitutes for one another. An engineer dies, we put another, another engineer in the same place, and the big industrial machine continues.
But in the world of creativity, that's wrong. That's not going to work because people are going to have to come, with, come up with ideas that are you know, from other sectors. And they will not be able to come up with ideas because they don't know anything about other sectors. So instead of teaching subjects the way we do, why don't we teach topics? For example, rivers. We're not going to have math at 9 and history at 10 and geography at 11. We're going to talk for two weeks about rivers. So, you know, rivers, you can talk about rivers from a historical point of view and talk about the great civilizations of Mesopotamia and, uh, and uh, the Nile. And then we'll talk about economics, why all the great civilizations are always near to rivers. And then we'll talk about economics. Great cities, great business centers started all in rivers. And then we'll talk about physics, the water, right? It evaporates, it rains, it goes down through the rivers. And then we'll talk about biology and why rivers have a different biology from seas. See, the same concept, rivers, can be seen from different areas. You're still going to get the same information, math, history, economics, everything. But you'll learn to connect. And by being able to connect, you'll be able to be creative and you'll be able to innovate. Six, collaboration. Sociologist called Kevin Dunbar asked the question, where physically in innovating companies ideas take place? In the desk of the CEO? In the Department of Innovation? You know what the answer is? Near the water cooler where people go to drink. You know why? Because that, that's where people talk. Ideas usually come from interaction. So you've had many ideas, right, in your life. And sometimes you think that there's been an, a eureka moment. You know eureka? Eureka moment is when uh, Archimedes, supposedly, when the king asked Archimedes to, no, to, to uh, evaluate how much gold was in his crown. Uh, he was a geometrist, so he, he knew about perfect shapes. The volume of a sphere, the volume of a cube. But the, the crown was imperfect, so he couldn't, he couldn't really measure the volume, the amount of gold. So when he was taking a bath with a crown, you know, the typical day that you take a bath with your crown, with a gold crown, he saw that the water level went up. So when the water level went up, he presumably said, Eureka, I found it. And if from, the, from that moment on, the Eureka moment is a moment where, boom, you have the idea. Newton's apple falls in his head, boom, the theory of uh, uh, gravitation, uh, universal gravitation comes to his mind. That doesn't happen that way. It took 30 years for Darwin to, to, to polish his uh, theory of evolution. You had ideas, right? You are in the shower, boom, you got a great idea. You talk to a friend, it was a very, very, very bad idea. But your friend helps you model your idea and change your idea and shape your idea. And through uh, discussions, your idea evolves until you come up with a final idea. Ideas come from interaction, the Medici effect. It's not surprise that it's called the Medici effect. Medici effect is the episode in uh, Italy when the Medici, a big uh, business family, banking family, financed all the scientists and philosophers and, uh, and uh, artists of all Europe to go to Florence and talk to each other. And the age of enlightenment started because they were next to each other, because people talked to each other. So great innovative companies are uh, uh, focusing on promoting that. If you look at the headquarters of any innovative company, Google, uh, Desigual, uh, you know, any company, any of the modern company, Pixar, they have no walls. They're designed, the company, the offices are designed so people interact all the time. Because interaction is the key to creating ideas. Big corporations led by Pixar created what they call corporate universities. Corporate universities are not so a place where your workers go to learn stuff. Corporate universities are a place where people, workers of a company, with different parts of the company, get together for a week and talk about the company because they see the same company from different sides, different realities, because the company from the marketing point of view has nothing to do with the company from the finance point of view. Only when you put people together and you see the different parts of the dice, you realize it's a dice. It has six faces. 
And seven, and last, implementation. Ideas that are not implemented are useless. See, the last, the last uh, scene of uh, Raiders of the Lost Ark, remember that? After Indiana Jones is fighting with the Nazis and gets the uh, Ark of the Covenant, he gets it, he takes it to the United States. Big success. And the last scene of the movie is the Ark goes into a big box, and the big box is stored in a place with millions and millions and millions of other boxes. Well, that place is the place that also stores all the ideas that have never been implemented. If you have an idea and you don't implement it, it's not, it's not productive, it's not useful. Which takes me back to Nokia. Why? was a Nokia not innovative? Why did Nokia die? As I said, they spent tons and tons of R and in R&D. They created millions and millions of patents. They had a patent book that was worth hundreds of millions of dollars. Scientists have gone to those patents, and now they realize that they had everything they needed to create the iPhone. But they didn't. They had the ideas, they didn't implement them. Why didn't they implement the iPhone? Well, the answer is because they protected core business. Their business was doing very well. They were selling 250 million copies of every phone they produced. Huge success. And they thought that if we, they come up with a new kind of phone, a smartphone that not only allows you to make phone calls, that was their business, but they also allow you to, it also allows you to send emails, and take pictures, and videos, and kill pigs with birds, and all kinds of useful things. If you do that, you're going to kill the business they have, which is traditional phones. So they had the iPhone right there. But in order to protect their business, they didn't implement it. And that was their death. That was the keys of death. And that's the last lesson I want to convey to you. Many businesses blame governments. Many scientists, many economists blame governments. We heard it this morning. Regulation, corruption, infrastructures, right? Government, government, government. But see, sometimes the worst enemy of innovation is the business itself. By trying to protect their own market, they kill new ideas. Thank you very much.